What's up everybody and welcome to part 7 of my basics of deep learning series. In the previous video we left off with the observation that for this function here we can determine the minimum with an analytical approach. So the question then was how do we then find the minimum of this function? This is what we're going to answer now. Namely, instead of using an analytical approach, we're going to use a numerical approach. So instead of manipulating the equations themselves, we're going to use different values for our w and see what our function outputs. And one of the most basic numerical approaches is probably a brute force approach, where we simply determine the y for a huge number of different w's. And then we simply check which of those w's will result in the lowest y. In this way, we can then an approximation uh, for the minimum of this function. Because you could imagine, for example, that if we would use here three digits instead of two, then we could find, then we could find a, a w that would result in an even lower y. And if we would use four digits, then accordingly we would also get uh, a w which would result in an even lower y, uh, yeah, y, and so on. So a general characteristic of numerical approaches is that the solution that we will get is only an approximation and not an exact value like we had with this analytical approach here. Okay, now you can probably imagine that uh, such a brute force approach is not really practical for our more complex function because here we don't just have one variable but we have many variables. So in this case 14. And you could imagine for example that if we would use uh, 100 values for each of those 14 weights then the number of calculations that we would have to do is 100 raised to the power of 14. So clearly to execute all those uh, calculations and then find the one combination that will result, uh, the combination of weights that will result in the lowest mean squared error would just simply take too long. And that's even despite the fact that this neural net here is relatively small. Uh, so for larger nets with many more weights, this brute force approach is even less practical. So clearly we need a different numerical approach for finding the minimum of this function here. So what could such an approach look like? Well, one thing we could do is, for example, we could simply randomly pick a value for our w, for example, 1.9. So we would be at this point in the graph. And then we somehow adjust this w. So we either increase it or decrease it so that our function thereby is somewhat reduced and then we get somewhere closer to the minimum. And for that, for that adjustment of this w, we can take advantage of the fact that the derivative at that point tells us how our y changes if we uh, slightly increase our w. So when w is 1.9, if we then uh, increase it by a tiny amount, then y would change by 25.66 that amount times that amount. So this is actually the opposite of what we want to do. So if we instead decrease our w by the value of the derivative at this point, so by the derivative of y evaluated at w, then our y should get uh, smaller and we should get uh, closer to the minimum. But as you can actually see in this example here, if we just use the derivative as it is and subtract minus, uh, subtract 25.66 from our w, then we actually overshoot the minimum. And our w would then be way to the left of this diagram. And our y colony then would be extremely high. So then we would be even further away from the minimum than we were before. And even worse, at this new w, the slope, uh, the magnitude of the slope is even bigger. So if we are again using this update rule, then we would be moving in the right direction because we are subtracting the derivative 
and here the derivative is negative so we would then actually increase our w so we would again move into the right direction but the step that we take is way too big and we show overshoot the minimum again and we are even further away than before and this just keeps escalating and we get further and further away from the minimum so clearly we can just take the derivative as it is but we have to scale it down somewhat so we are going to multiply it by a factor which we denote with this alpha here and this alpha is what's called the learning rate and typical values for the learning rate are for example 0 0.1 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 and so on and in our case let's set the learning rate to 0 0.01 if we then update our w based on this rule then the new w would be 1.64 so we would, uh, would move from that point to this one and here the slope is only 12.5 so if we now again use this update rule then the new w will be 1.52 so we are then moving from that point to this one and here you can also uh, already see an advantage of using the derivative in our update rule because if the slope is steep so if we are somewhere far away from the minimum then we're going to update our w by a large amount and if the slope is not so steep so if you are somewhere closer to the minimum then we're going to update our w by a smaller amount and if we now do many many more iterations of this update rule then we get step by step closer to the minimum and at some point then we stop and here then again we get an approximation for our w where our function is minimized and this way uh, of finding the minimum so where we uh, just randomly pick a value and here we could have also picked any value on this graph and then using the derivative to step by step get closer to the minimum is called gradient descent because we are using the gradient which is just another word for slope to descend the function towards the minimum and this concept of gradient descent we also have to apply to our more complex function because here too we can't determine the min uh, minimum with an analytical approach so the second element that we're going to need to determine the right parameters is gradient descent. The only difference here is that we don't just have one weight, but we have many weights. So to execute then one gradient step, we will have to update all of those weights simultaneously based on the derivative of the mean squared error with respect to that particular weight. And because of that, we then have to make use of something called partial derivatives and not just this regular derivative. And the partial derivatives are denoted not just by this uh, regular d here, but they are denoted by this stylized version of a d. So now let's again look at a simpler function than our mean squared error function to explain the concept of partial derivatives. So let's say uh, y is a function of weight 1 and weight 2 and it looks like this and since we now have uh, two independent variables the graph is also uh, is going to be in 3d graph and it's going to look like that and since we have those two uh, variables we have to uh, determine two partial derivatives the partial derivative of y with respect to weight 1 which tells us how y changes if we slightly increase weight 1 and the partial derivative of y with respect to weight 2 which tells us how y changes if we slightly increase weight 2. So now let's uh, write down the formulas for those partial derivatives and this is actually pretty easy to do because if you want to determine the partial derivative of y with respect to weight 1 then you simply treat weight 2 as a constant so accordingly then uh, the function looks like that. So we simply bring down the 2 in front of the w and multiply it with this 2 and then we have 4 times weight 
1. And if you want to determine the partial derivative of y with respect to weight 2, then you simply treat weight 1 as a constant, and then we get this formula. Now to understand what those formulas tell us, let's look at, an, uh, at a specific example point. So let's set weight 1 to minus 8 and weight 2 to 7. In that case, y would be 177, and this is this particular point here. So weight 1 is minus 8, and weight 2 is 7. And if we now uh, put in those values here into the equations of the partial derivatives, then we get a minus 32 and a 14. And what those values now tell us is, in contrast to the regular derivative, not the slope of this function here, because if you look at this point here, you can't really ask what's the slope of the surface at this particular point. Because if you move, for example, in this direction, then the function will increase. And if you move in this direction, it would decrease. So we can only ask, uh, what's the slope of this function at this particular point in a certain direction? And this is what the partial derivative derivatives tell us. The partial derivative of y with respect to weight 1 uh, tells us the slope in the direction of weight 1. So it tells us how our y changes if we move along the weight 1 axis. And as you can see by this line here that goes through the point, this has a negative slope at that point and the slope is pretty steep, which matches the value of minus 32. And then the partial derivative of y with respect to weight 2 tells us the slope in the weight 2 direction. So it tells us how y changes if we move uh, along the weight 2 axis. And as you can see by this line here that goes through the point, this has a positive slope at that point and it's not as steep as uh, the slope that we saw before. So this matches then uh, the value of 14. So this is uh, what partial derivatives are and how we can interpret them. So let's, uh, let's now use them to apply the gradient descent algorithm to this function to determine the minimum. And here as a side note, we could also just use an analytical approach by setting both partial derivatives equal to zero and then solving those equations. But we are going to use a gradient descent to find the minimum. And in contrast to before, we don't just have to update one variable, but with each gradient uh, descent step, we have to update all of our variables simultaneously. And if we do that many times, then the path that we're gonna take looks like this. So here again, you can see that we are taking big steps in the beginning and then those steps get smaller and smaller. And then the solution that we get is again just going to be an approximation. So uh, weight, one, uh, weight 1 and weight 2 are not going to be exactly 0 but somewhere close to 0. And this path here that you can see is actually the fastest path to the minimum. You could imagine, for example, that if you hold a ball at this point here and then you drop it into the surface, then it will approximately roll down along this path. And this curve here happens because, again, the surface is much steeper along the weight 1 axis than it is along the weight 2 axis. And now, to get an intuition why this might be actually the fastest path, let's think about or let's see what happens to our point if we don't update both of our both of our variables simultaneously but just one at a time. So if we only update uh, weight 1, so if you're only moving along the weight 1 axis, then we would move from that point to this one and if you only update weight 2, so if you're only moving along the weight 2 axis, 
then we would get from this point to that one. And as you can see, both of those points are actually higher up on the surface than the point where we uh, updated both of our variables. And intuitively this makes sense because if you can decrease the y by changing weight 1, and if you also can decrease y by changing weight 2, then if you do both of those uh, updates, then y should decrease even more. And that's exactly what we are doing here. We are basically just adding together those two movements. So for example, if we first move to this point, then we add to that simply this movement here. And that would look like this. So we are first moving to that point and then we add this other movement. And the result of that is simply our first gradient step. So the movement from that point to this one is actually the fastest way to reduce y given that you are at this particular point. And one thing that you might hear uh, in this context is that the gradient, which is just a vector containing the partial derivatives, is the direction of steepest ascent. And if we take the negative gradient, then obviously uh, this will be then the direction of steepest descent. Okay, so that's now how gradient descent works with partial derivatives. And if we go back to our overview graphic, then what we now have to do is we have to randomly assign values to all of our weights. And then to execute one gradient step, we have to update all those weights simultaneously. And therefore, then we need to determine, in this case, 14 partial derivatives. And if we then do, uh, do many of those steps, then we can find the minimum of this function here. And one thing that will all of that uh, will all of that easier to do is the fact that all our weights are stored in matrices. So we don't have to update those weights in all individually, but we only have to update our weight matrices. And, and so we also only have to determine uh, the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to weight matrix one and the partial derivative of the mean squared error with respect to weight matrix two. And the good thing is, no, uh, no matter how big those matrices are, we still only have to determine those two partial derivatives. So for example, let's say we would have two additional nodes in the hidden layer, then we would have eight additional nodes going from the input layer, uh, eight additional weights going from the input layer to the hidden layer, and six additional weights going from the hidden layer to the output layer. So in total, we would have then to update 28 weights. But since all those weights are stored in matrices, we still only have to uh, update uh, our two weight matrices. So once again, uh, linear algebra makes our lives much easier. And now to actually apply the gradient descent algorithm uh, to this cost function, we have to uh, determine the formulas for those two partial derivatives. And how to do that will be the topic of the upcoming video. So thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next video.